Poor Helen, she has witnessed firsthand her husband being unfaithful with her friend. Well, not really her friend, but Annabella. She found them in the shrubbery. They were together conspiring, kissing, saying they loved one another. And when Annabella said, do you still love your wife? Uh, Arthur Huntington said, no, not a bit. And then he pledged his love to her and said, I got to keep Helen thinking everything's okay for a while longer. Well, Helen is straightforward. Later that night, she didn't want to face the whole group. So she said she was not feeling well and waited until dinner was over. Then she made sure that she caught her husband, Arthur, alone to have a word. And she was serious. She did not beat around the bush. She said, I know what's going on. And he said, oh, everybody's just talking. It's loose talk. She said, I don't know it secondhand. I know it firsthand. I saw you in the shrubbery. He realizes his cotton and goes, okay, fine. What do you want to do about it? <laughs> and she says, would you let me and Arthur, little Arthur, go with my fortune? He says, no. Would you let me and Arthur go and you keep the money? No. Very well. We will live together as roommates. I am no longer your lover. I am not to be petted. She leaves the door open for should he decide to repent. And she said she'd find it hard, but she'll forgive him. So that's where it's left. What a revelation. And the worst part of it is that everybody knew except for her. Well, Hargrave tried to tell her, but she wouldn't hear it. Now she knows what he was trying to say. Also, Rachel was trying to mention it, but couldn't bring herself to. So she made allusions like, Annabella should not be staying in this house one minute longer. Poor Helen, poor naive Helen. Not anymore. Now she knows what's going on and she has put her foot down. We'll see what happens next. Is this a tolerable situation? Today I'll be reading chapters 34 and 35 because they're short. Chapter 34, Concealment. Evening. Breakfast passed well over. I was calm and cool throughout. I answered composedly all inquiries respecting my health and whatever was unusual in my look or manner was generally attributed to the trifling indisposition that had occasioned my early retirement last night. But how am I to get over the 10 or 12 days that must yet elapse before they go? Yet, why so long for their departure? When they are gone, how shall I get through the months or years of my future life in company with that man, my greatest enemy? For none could injure me as he has done. Oh, when I think how fondly, how foolishly I have loved him, how madly I have trusted him, how constantly I've labored and studied and prayed and struggled for his advantage, and how cruelly he has trampled on my love, betrayed my trust, scorned my prayers and tears and efforts for his preservation, crushed my hopes, destroyed my youth's best feelings, and doomed me to a life of hopeless misery as far as man can do it. It is not enough to say that I no longer love my husband. I hate him. The word stares me in the face like a guilty confession, but it is true. I hate him. I hate him. But God have mercy on his miserable soul and make him see and feel his guilt. I ask no other vengeance. If he could but fully know and truly feel my wrongs, I should well be avenged and I could freely pardon all. But he is so lost, so hardened in his heartless depravity that in this life I believe he never will. But it is useless dwelling on this theme. Let me seek once more to dissipate reflection in the minor details of passing events. Mr. Hargrave has annoyed me all day long with his serious sympathizing and, as he thinks, an obtrusive politeness. If it were more obtrusive, it would trouble me less, for then I could snub him. But as it is, he contrives to appear so really kind and thoughtful that I cannot do so without rudeness and seeming ingratitude. I sometimes think I ought to give him credit for the good feeling he simulates so well. And then again, I think it is my duty to suspect him under the peculiar circumstances in which I am placed. His kindness may not all be feigned, but still, let not the purest impulse of gratitude to him induce me to forget myself. Let me remember the game of chess, the expressions he used on the occasion, and those indescribable looks of his that so justly roused my indignation. 
and I think I shall be safe enough. I have done well to record them so minutely. I think he wishes to find an opportunity of speaking to me alone. He has seemed to be on the watch all day, but I have taken care to disappoint him. Not that I fear anything he could say, but I have trouble enough without the addition of his insulting consolations, condolences, or whatever else he might attempt. And for Millicent's sake, I do not wish to quarrel with him. He excused himself from going out to shoot with the other gentlemen in the morning under the pretext of having letters to write. And instead of retiring for that purpose into the library, he sent for his desk into the morning room where I was seated with Millicent and Lady Lowborough. They had betaken themselves to their work. I, less to divert my mind than to deprecate conversation, had provided myself with a book. Millicent saw that I wished to be quiet and accordingly let me alone. Annabella, doubtless, saw it too, but that was no reason why she should restrain her tongue or curb her cheerful spirits. She, accordingly, chatted away, addressing herself almost exclusively to me, and with the utmost assurance and familiarity growing the more animated and friendly, the colder and briefer my answers became. Mr. Hargrave saw that I could ill endure it, and looking up from his desk, he answered her questions and observations for me as far as he could, and attempted to transfer her social attentions from me to himself, but it would not do. Perhaps she thought I had a headache and could not bear to talk. At any rate, she saw that her loquacious vivacity annoyed me, as I could tell by the malicious pertinacity with which she persisted. But I checked it effectually by putting into her hand the book I had been trying to read on the flyleaf of which I had hastily scribbled. I am too well acquainted with your character and conduct to feel any real friendship for you. And, as I am without your talent for dissimulation, I cannot assume the appearance of it. I must therefore beg that hereafter all familiar intercourse may cease between us. And if I still continue to treat you with civility, as if you were a woman worthy of consideration and respect, understand that it is out of regard for your cousin Millicent's feelings, not for yours. Upon perusing this, she turned scarlet and bit her lip. Covertly tearing away the leaf, she crumpled it up and put it into the fire and then employed herself in turning over the pages of the book and really, or apparently, perusing its contents. In a little while, Millicent announced it her intention to repair to the nursery and asked if I would accompany her. Annabella will excuse us, said she. She's busy reading. No, I won't, cried Annabella, suddenly looking up and throwing her book on the table. I want to speak to Helen a minute. You may go, Millicent, and she'll follow in a while. Millicent went. Will you oblige me, Helen, continued she. Her impudence astounded me, but I complied and followed her into the library. She closed the door and walked up to the fire. Who told you this, said she. No one. I am not incapable of seeing for myself. Ah, you are suspicious, cried she, smiling with a gleam of hope. Hitherto there had been a kind of desperation in her hardihood. Now she was evidently relieved. If I were suspicious, I replied, I should have discovered your infamy long before. No, Lady Lowborough, I do not found my charge upon suspicion. On what do you found it then, said she, throwing herself into the armchair, and stretching out her feet to the fender with an obvious effort to appear composed. I enjoy a moonlight ramble as well as you, I answered steadily, fixing my eyes upon her, and the shrubbery happens to be one of my favorite resorts. She colored again excessively and remained silent, pressing her finger against her teeth and gazing into the fire. I watched her a few moments with a feeling of malevolent gratification. Then moving towards the door, I calmly asked if she had anything more to say. Yes, yes, she cried eagerly, starting up from her reclining posture. I want to know if you will tell Lord Lowborough. Suppose I do. Well, if you are disposed to publish the matter, I cannot dissuade you, of course, but there will be terrible work if you do. And if you don't, I shall think you the most generous of mortal beings. And if there is anything in the world I can do for you, anything short of, she hesitated, short of renouncing your guilty connection with my husband, I suppose you mean, said I. 
She paused in evident disconcertion and perplexity mingled with anger she dared not show. I cannot renounce what is dearer than life, she muttered in a low hurried tone. Then suddenly raising her head and fixing her gleaming eyes upon me, she continued earnestly, but Helen or Mrs. Huntingdon or whatever you would have me call you, will you tell him? If you are generous, here is a fitting opportunity for the exercise of your magnanimity. If you are proud, here am I, your rival, ready to acknowledge myself your debtor for an act of the most noble forbearance. I shall not tell him. You will not, cried she delightedly. Accept my sincere thanks, then. She sprang up and offered me her hand. I drew back. Give me no thanks. It is not for your sake that I refrain. Neither is it an act of any forbearance. I have no wish to publish your shame. I should be sorry to distress your husband with the knowledge of it. And Millicent, will you tell her? No, on the contrary, I shall do my utmost to conceal it from her. I would not for much that she should know for the infamy and disgrace of her relation. You use hard words, Mrs. Huntingdon, but I can pardon you. And now, Lady Lowborough, continued I, let me counsel you to leave this house as soon as possible. You must be aware that your continuance here is excessively disagreeable to me. Not for Mr. Huntingdon's sake, said I, observing the dawn of a malicious smile of triumph on her face. You are welcome to him if you like him, as far as I am concerned. But because it is painful to be always disguising my true sentiments respecting you and straining to keep up an appearance of civility and respect towards one for whom I have not the most distant shadow of esteem, and because if you stay, your conduct cannot possibly remain concealed much longer from the only two persons in the house who do not know it already. And for your husband's sake, Annabella, and even for your own, I wish, I earnestly advise and entreat you to break off this unlawful connection at once and return to your duty while you may before the dreadful consequences. Yes, yes, of course, said she interrupting me with a gesture of impatience. But I cannot go, Helen, before the time appointed for our departure. What possible pretext could I frame for such a thing, whether I proposed going back alone, which Lowborough would not hear of, or taking him with me, the very circumstance itself would be certain to excite suspicion, and when our visit is so nearly at an end too, little more than a week, surely you can endure my presence so long, I will not annoy you with any more of my friendly impertinences. Well, I have nothing more to say to you. Have you mentioned this affair to Huntingdon? Asked she as I was leaving the room. How dare you mention his name to me? Was the only answer I gave. No words have passed between us since, but such as outward decency or pure necessity demanded. End of chapter 34. Chapter 35, Provocations. 19th. In proportion as Lady Lowborough finds she has nothing to fear from me, and as the time of departure draws nigh, the more audacious and insolent she becomes. She does not scruple to speak to my husband with affectionate familiarity in my presence when nobody else is by, and is particularly fond of displaying her interest in his health and welfare or anything that concerns him, as if for the purpose of contrasting her kind solicitude with my cold indifference. And he rewards her by such smiles and glances, such whispered words or boldly spoken insinuations indicative of his sense of her goodness and my neglect, as makes the blood rush into my face in spite of myself. For I would be utterly regardless of it all, deaf and blind to everything that passes between them. Since the more I show myself sensible of their wickedness, the more she triumphs in her victory, and the more he flatters himself that I love him devotedly still, in spite of my pretended indifference. Oh, such occasions I have sometimes been startled by a subtle fiendish suggestion inciting me to show him the contrary, by a seeming encouragement of Hargrave's advances. But such ideas are banished in a moment with horror and self-abasement. And then I hate him tenfold more than ever for having brought me to this. God pardon me for it. And all my sinful thoughts Instead of being humbled and purified by my afflictions, I feel that they are turning my nature into gall. This must be my fault as much as theirs that wrong me. No true Christian would cherish such bitter feelings as I do against him and her, especially the latter. 
Him, I still feel that I could pardon freely, gladly, on the slightest token of repentance. But she, words cannot utter my abhorrence. Reason forbids, but passion urges strongly. And I must pray and struggle long ere I subdue it. It is well that she is leaving tomorrow, for I could not well endure her presence for another day. This morning she rose earlier than usual. I found her in the room alone, and then I went down to breakfast. Oh, Helen, is it you? said she, turning as I entered. I gave an involuntary start back on seeing her, at which she uttered a short laugh, observing, I think we are both disappointed. I came forward and busied myself with the breakfast things. This is the last day I shall burden your hospitality, said she, as she seated herself at the table. Ah, here comes one that will not rejoice at it, she murmured half to herself as Arthur entered the room. He shook hands with her and wished her good morning, then looked lovingly in her face and still retaining her hand in his, murmured pathetically, the last, last day. Yes, said she with some asperity, and I rose early to make the best of it. I have been here alone this half hour, and you, you lazy creature. Well, I thought I was early too, said he, but, dropping his voice almost to a whisper, you see, we are not alone. We never are, returned she, but they were almost as good as alone, for I was now standing at the window watching the clouds and struggling to suppress my wrath. Some more words passed between them, which happily I did not overhear. But Annabella had the audacity to come and place herself beside me, and even to put her hand upon my shoulder and say softly, You need not grudge him to me, Helen, for I love him more than ever you could do. This put me beside myself. I took her hand and violently dashed it from me with an expression of abhorrence and indignation that could not be suppressed. Startled, almost appalled by this sudden outbreak, she recoiled in silence. I would have given way to my fury and said more. But Arthur's low laugh recalled me to myself. I checked the half-uttered invective and scornfully turned away, regretting that I had given him so much amusement. He was still laughing when Mr. Hargrave made his appearance. How much of the scene he had witnessed, I do not know. For the door was ajar when he entered, and he greeted his host and his cousin both coldly, and me with a glance intended to express the deepest sympathy, mingled with high admiration and esteem. How much allegiance do you owe to that man? He asked below his breath, as he stood beside me at the window, affecting to be making observations on the weather. None. I answered, and immediately returning to the table, I employed myself in making the tea. He followed, and would have entered into some kind of conversation with me, but the other guests were now beginning to assemble, and I took no more notice of him except to give him his coffee. After breakfast, determined to pass as little of the day as possible in the company with Lady Lowborough, I quietly stole away from the company and retired to the library. Mr. Hargrave followed me thither under pretense of coming for a book, and first turning to the shelves, he selected a volume, and then, quietly, but by no means timidly approaching me, he stood beside me, resting his hand on the back of my chair, and said softly, And so you consider yourself free at last? Yes, said I, without moving or raising my eyes from my book, free to do anything but offend God and my conscience. There was a momentary pause. Very right, said he, provided your conscience be not so morbidly tender, and your ideas of God not too erroneously severe. But can you suppose it would offend that benevolent being to make the happiness of one who would die for yours, to raise a devoted heart from purgatorial torments, to a state of heavenly bliss when you could do it without the slightest injury to yourself or any other. This was spoken in a low, earnest, melting tone as he bent over me. I now raised my head and steadily confronting his eyes, I answered calmly, Mr. Hargrave, do you mean to insult me? He was not prepared for this. He paused a moment to recover the shock. Then drawing himself up and removing his hand from my chair, he answered with proud sadness, that was not my intention. I just glanced toward the door with a slight movement of the head and then returned to my book. He immediately withdrew. 
This was better than if I had answered with more words and in the passionate spirit to which my first impulse would have prompted. What a good thing it is to be able to command one's temper. I must labor to cultivate this inestimable quality. God only knows how often I shall need it in this rough, dark road that lies before me. In the course of the morning, I drove with the two ladies to give Millicent an opportunity for bidding farewell to her mother and sister. They persuaded her to stay with them the rest of the day, Mrs. Hargrave promising to bring her back in the evening and remain until the party broke up on the morrow. Consequently, Lady Lowborough and I had the pleasure of returning tete-a-tete in the carriage together. For the whole first mile or two, we kept silence, I looking out of my window and she leaning back in her corner. But I was not going to restrict myself to any particular position for her. When I was tired of leaning forward with the cold, raw wind in my face and surveying the russet hedges and the damp, tangled grass of their banks, I gave it up and leaned back too. With her usual impudence, my companion then made some remarks to get up a conversation. But... The monosyllables, yes, or no, or humph, were the utmost her several remarks could elicit from me. At last, on her asking my opinion about some immaterial point of discussion, I answered, Why do you wish to talk to me, Lady Lowborough? You must know what I think of you. Well, if you will be so bitter against me, replied she, I can't help it, but I'm not going to sulk for anybody. Our short drive was now at an end. As soon as the carriage door was open, she sprang out and went down the park to meet the gentlemen who were just returning from the woods. Of course, I did not follow. But I had not done with her impudence yet. After dinner, I retired to the drawing room as usual, and she accompanied me. But I had the two children with me, and I gave them my whole attention and determined to keep them till the gentlemen came, or till Millicent arrived with her mother. Little Helen, however, was soon tired of playing and insisted upon going to sleep. And while I sat on the sofa with her on my knee and Arthur seated beside me, gently playing with her soft flaxen hair, Lady Lowborough composedly came and placed herself on the other side. Tomorrow, Mrs. Huntingdon, said she, you will be delivered from my presence, which no doubt you will be very glad of. It is natural you should, but... Do you know I have rendered you a great service? Shall I tell you what it is? I shall be glad to hear of any service you have rendered me, said I, determined to be calm, for I knew by the tone of her voice she wanted to provoke me. Well, returned she, have you not observed this salutary change in Mr. Huntingdon? Don't you see what a sober, temperate man he has become? You saw with regret the sad habits he was contracting. I know and I know you did your utmost to deliver him from them, but without success, until I came to your assistance, I told him, in few words, that I could not bear to see him degrade himself so, and that I should cease to, no matter what I told him. But you see the reformation I have wrought, and you ought to thank me for it. I rose and rang for the nurse. But I desire no thanks, she continued. All the return I ask is that you will take care of him while I am gone, and not by harshness and neglect drive him back to his old courses. I was almost sick with passion, but Rachel was now at the door. I pointed to the children, for I could not trust myself to speak. She took them away, and I followed. Will you, Helen? continued the speaker. I gave her a look that blighted the malicious smile on her face, or checked it at least for a moment, and departed. In the ante room, I met Mr. Hargrave. He saw I was in no humor to be spoken to, and he suffered me to pass without a word, but when after a few minutes seclusion in the library, I had regained my composure and was returning to join Mrs. Hargrave and Millicent, whom I had just heard come downstairs and go into the drawing room, I found him there still, lingering in the dimly lighted apartment and evidently waiting for me. Mrs. Huntingdon, he said as I passed, will you allow me one word? What is it then? Be quick if you please. I offended you this morning, and I cannot live under your displeasure. Then go and sin no more, replied I, turning away. No, no, he said hastily, setting himself before me. Pardon me, but I must have your forgiveness. I leave you tomorrow, and I may not have an opportunity of speaking to you again. I was wrong to forget myself and you as I did. But let me implore you to forget and forgive my rash presumption and think of me in those words that have never been spoken. For believe me, 
I regret them deeply, and the loss of your esteem is too severe a penalty. I cannot bear it. Forgetfulness is not to be purchased with a wish, and I cannot bestow my esteem on all who desire it unless they deserve it too. I shall think my life well spent in laboring to deserve it, if you will but pardon this offense, will you? Yes. Yes, but that is coldly spoken. Give me your hand and I'll believe you. You won't? Then, Mrs. Huntingdon, you do not forgive me. Yes, here it is, and my forgiveness with it. Only sin no more. He pressed my cold hand with sentimental fervor and said nothing, and stood aside to let me pass into the room where all the company were now assembled. Mr. Grimsby was seated near the door. On seeing me enter, almost immediately followed by Hargrave, he leered at me with a glance of intolerable significance as I passed. I looked at him in the face until he sullenly turned away, if not ashamed, at least confounded for the moment. Meantime, Hattersley had seized Hargrave by the arm and was whispering something in his ear, some coarse joke, no doubt, for the latter neither laughed nor spoke in answer, but turning from him with a slight curl of the lip, disengaged himself and went to his mother, who was telling Lord Lowborough how many reasons she had to be proud of her son. Thank heaven they're all going tomorrow. End of chapter 35.